Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. dedicated to highlighting the ongoing water crisis around the world to inspire the general public, policymakers, and academics to make action to protect water pollution and over-exportation. Please welcome the Executive Director and CEO of the global nonprofit Water Film Festival, Robert Strand. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Robert Strand, which he is the youngest of his family, so he let me know that he is the last strand. (laughs) And if you guys know me, you guys know I love a great dad joke. So, Robert, welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. How are you doing? That is great. How are you? And I didn't didn't know that you were such a dad joke. Oh, man, I'm I'm, I'm a dad joke. I'm all about it right now. I'm all about the dad jokes for some reason. Uh, It's some reason it's just like, you know, got two kids and just got to, Keeps me a little bit alive, right? <laughs> so, well, so, if you ever make it, if you ever make it to New York, I would love to take you to Punderdome, which is a pun competition here in Brooklyn. I compete for an as seen on TV product prize, no. and uh, my stage name, my stage name is Kenny Do It. <laughs> no, oh yes, we're gonna talk more about this after the show because I am very intrigued. I went, to, in fact. I went to Syracuse, so I can go out to New York sometime. I need to get make it back out there at some point. So, Robert, first, Robert, awesome. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, about the um, World Water Film Festival. Where I'll talk about a little bit about the Blake Project, but first, let's talk a little bit about Robert. Who is Robert Strand? Ah, uh, who is Robert Strand? Um, I am uh, a creative brand strategist. I'm someone that likes to look for and help people find like the best in themselves um, and what's the best impact that they can have on the world uh, with either who they are as a person or who they are professionally or within their business. Um, I am a foreign language major from an engineering school um, and child of gifted academics. And I didn't necessarily inherit the science brain. Um, From the parents, but uh, nonetheless, uh, haven't enjoyed uh, a wonderful career. I'm very lucky. Um, And, uh, you know, for a long time, I think I sort of was the kid that kind of got a a B without any effort. If I put a little effort, I would get an A in school. Um, And I kind of followed that a little bit into my career where things kind of started to came my way. But then I really found with sense of like once I figured out where I wanted to go in this world I would say that this entrepreneurial spirit kicked in and uh, whether I'm in an established corporate environment or an entrepreneurial environment I always seek to foster an entrepreneurial environment either way in any place that I've been and it's uh, a, a joy to be able to do that so French German and Arabic wow I spent a year in I spent a year in France studying French German and Arabic in French um, which was really trippy. Um, and uh, you know, I graduated from college thinking I was going to save the world. I got a job for the headquarters of the Peace Corps in uh, Washington, D.C., in their placement office, determining where people would spend the next two years of their lives. Um, I moved up to New York City, and kind of like in the movie Big, when you see Tom Hanks walking into FAO Schwarz, if you remember that movie, if you haven't seen that movie, watch that movie. Um that's literally kind of what happened to me. I walked into FAO Schwartz to get a job to make ends meet demonstrating toys when I first moved to New York City. And uh, I was fast tracked to their buying office. And suddenly I'm a re- recent college grad. I'm a toy buyer. I'm the Lego buyer, um, you know, which was super exciting. And I've enjoyed uh, an evolved career in consumer products working uh, both for 
small entrepreneurial entities as well as well-established um, corporate trademark brands, brand entities. Spent five years at the National Basketball Association, which many of my friends um, laughed at because I was not gifted with eye-hand coordination. <laughs> so so when I told my, some of my friends I got a job for the NBA, like, was it a phone interview? Like, what, what happened? Um, but what's interesting about that is uh, the NBA. So when Michael Jordan first retired, if you're a basketball fan, there was a big lockout. And the NBA was actually recruiting somebody into their consumer products business who did not come from sports. But some of the new retail that new licensing and uh, would bring kind of an entrepreneurial spirit to the business because nobody wanted to do business with the NBA at that, at that point in time. Um, and I was part of a team that helped rebuild the NBA consumer products business to exceed Jordan era revenue numbers in five years. Um, so uh, I'm very lucky I've gotten to work for some amazing, amazing uh, companies, people, mentors. Um, I guess that sort of gives you a little bit of the background, which led me to being a partner at the Blake Project, which is a strategic brand consultancy, um, as well as serving as founder and executive director of the World Water Film Festival. So before I ask about the Blake Festival, I got to ask this question. Are you going to be portrayed in the new Michael Jordan movie? <laughs> will, will you be in oh. there? <laughs> oh, I'm so behind the scenes. No, <laughs> I, I, I don't even, I don't even think my, 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 my role would have gotten a background actor position in that story. So, so let's talk about the Blake project for the listeners at home. What is the Blake project? So the Blake project, it's a brand consultancy. And what we do is we help startups, national, global brands, really discover what their unique value is and help them sort of discover um, what can they own in the minds of those who are most important to their future. So we help clients create uh, like a competitive and valuable future. And we do that through research, brand research, brand strategy, brand growth strategy, such as licensing um, and brand education. So what's a differentiator for us is that we help our clients be better stewards of their brands by infusing brand education in everything we do. So it's very unconsultant like. We really are like true partners. We we don't want to create a dependency on us. Um, and we don't do any of the, if you will, activation, if you will. Like we're not an advertising agency. I don't do visual branding work. But where is part of the strategy if those elements are part of a strategy, we will work and serve as a steward and a thinking partner to our clients as they're evaluating what third party resources or internal resources to bring on to uh, bring that execution, if you will, to life. So we're more behind the scenes. And who who is your typical client of client? Do you guys have a kind of specific niche that you focus on or is it pretty broad? It's it's fairly broad. You know, we're we're fortunate that we have um, some big name clients that we've worked with. We've worked with um, currently we're working with the Opry Entertainment Group, as in Grand Old Opry. So um, clients like that, Southwest Airlines, Foot Joy, Coca Cola, um, established brands. We also uh, do work with some startups. Um, we do strategic consulting sometimes with personalities. We've been doing some work with Bernice King, daughter of Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, and sometimes we have clients that no one will ever heard of, have heard of. Um, but for example, a client, Belknap White, is the nation's largest flooring distributor. Um, and through acquisition, the three companies were coming together as one. So when you have three cultures coming together that are now going to uh, be reintroducing themselves in the world, we're brought in to help them figure out with them through storytelling, you know, what do you want to represent to the world? What would be missed if you if you guys dissolved and went away? What, what would be missed? Um, and so being able to work with clients to craft those stories um, is actually, it's a very beautiful thing because when you have a, a, and I say a good client, a good client is someone from top to bottom is willing to commit to a vision and a strategy and, um uh, embrace it. And so when we have clients like that, like Belknap White, it's just, it's a real joy to be able to, uh, to do the work that we do. Unfortunately, I see issues, um, bear with me. Sorry about that. Um, 
you know, where you have senior level people who will work on some deal or something, and then they never inform the people that actually have to do the work, what was decided or what the parameters of authority are or should be. Um, but uh, we actually also once did the licensing strategy for Entrepreneur Magazine, speaking of entrepreneurs. Nice, nice. So, uh, so there you go. There you go. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things you mentioned is what would be missed when we're gone, you know, and I think mm -hmm. that kind of leads into your kind of like your next project. What is the World Water Film Festival and what was the inspiration behind creating this nonprofit? <clears throat> so um, thank you for asking, because it's 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 becoming an increasingly more important um uh, passion project for me. And the more I get into it, the more I realize just right. how important it really is. By day, I've been working in retail brand strategy, brand education, brand monetization. Um, and on and off since about 2005, I've been studying a Meisner acting technique. So I've been a background actor in some films. Um, and I had been uh, studying with an amazing acting instructor who was as much a mentor and friend. And um, this just overwhelming urge hit me in the fall of 2020 during the pandemic to reconnect with my acting instructor. And I thought it was because I was having a midlife crisis and I was going to change <laughs> careers. I was going to pursue creative arts. And um, as it turned out, um, I started studying with her. And unfortunately, in January, she was diagnosed with cancer. And then we lost her in July. And so in her farewell message to her students, uh, Gabriel, she had said, you know, um, she got to do everything she wanted to do in her life. This isn't a complete tragedy. Would she have liked more time? Absolutely. But it was a very clear, believe in yourself, take some risks, don't be a people pleaser, don't be an a-hole, um, um, but really believe in yourself and put your acting chops to good use. And at that time, I learned that Pharmaceutical water pollution was one of the top three threats to New York City's public water. So this is a lesson for anybody to, to understand. Uh, if you have leftover medications, do not flush them down the toilet. Do not do that. Water systems were never contemplated to filter out pharmaceutical pollutants. They're already filtering them out through human waste, if you will. Um, and the problem is, is uh, this antidepressants, antibiotics, fentanyl, it is showing up in measurable quantities in people's drinking water and in species of fish that are being caught to be to be eaten. So to me, I heard pharmaceutical water pollution, pills and toilets that had comedy written all over it. So I made a comedic short film about the importance of uh, not flushing unused meds down the toilet to kind of honor my late acting instructor. And as we looked for a film festival that was about water to submit this film to, there were environmental film festivals over here or a documentary film festival about eco kind of, but there wasn't really an air apparent of a film festival about water, especially one that, that it was inclusive of different types of storytelling that had experimental films and that had narrative storytelling, dramas and comedies and animation. So I decided to create one. Uh, and the reason World Water Day or World Water Film Festival is I had discovered and kind of understanding and wrapping my head around water as I was researching my own film, that every year since 1993, every March 22nd, there's what's called UN World Water Day. And policymakers, academics, scientists, they'll agree upon a topic and they'll research it for a year and then they'll meet at the end of the year and talk about that, which they've learned. Not enough people in our country have heard of World Water Day. And we're becoming attuned to different water crises. Um, Apparently, I learned this week that we have actually broken the water cycle for the first time in humans' history, which I believe means there's more water in the atmosphere than there is um, fresh water in the atmosphere than there is on the earth. You hear about at atmospheric rivers. Um, so um, I had reached out to the entity. It's a UN water organization that was responsible for last year's World Water Day theme, which was groundwater making the invisible visible. Uh, organization called IGRAC, the International Groundwater Resource Assessment Center out of Delft, um, Netherlands, and said, hey, I'm, I made this film. I think I'm going to make a film festival about water. We would love to see if we can get filmmakers to be a part of this annual exploration that the scientists, policymakers, and academics are doing on water because 
sometimes those worlds can be siloed. Data lives in the head sometimes and doesn't connect to the heart. And it's when you connect things to the heart that you might actually influence and inspire action and change. Um, and IGRAC emailed us back the next day. And they said, we think this is a phenomenal idea. So since it's World Water Day, we created the World Water Film Festival. Um, flash forward a little over maybe not even two years, we screened 130 films about water, which is insane. Uh, we were able to partner with the Columbia University Climate School and Water Center to serve as our hosts. And just this past weekend as an official part of New York Water Week leading into this, the UN Water Conference that's in New York this week, uh, we screened over 80 films on three floors of this building. Um, and it was quite magical. Uh, magical is an understatement. It's still sinking in kind of what's happened this past week. Um, you know, to have a renowned scientist who, um, a guy by the name of John Cherry, he is a uh, founder of an organization called, nonprofit called The Groundwater Project. He's won awards and accolades. And I actually heard him speak at a UN Groundwater Summit uh, earlier this year. And in amongst the sea of, and it sort of relates to my day job, and to see of people that sort of sounded like they were saying the same thing over and over, kind of robotically, um, I heard this guy. He had a message, and I reached out to him. I'm like, I loved every word you said. Will you come introduce a film at my film festival? And he did. He came from Canada, and he came down to introduce a film at our film festival. Um, and uh, he, you know, this is a man that's been doing this for decades, and he was like, this is the best day I've spent in a long time. Every hydrology conference, every policymaking summit around water needs to start with one of these films. And that was a huge, that to me means I, I did a good job. Yeah. And I, I, I too cannot stress the importance of this. In fact, you know, uh, if you check out at the shades of E, you'll actually see a recent post of World Water Day. I kind of highlighted it on the social sites as well unbeknownst that we're going to be talking about this. This is just happened to be very, very organic that it happened. Now, you know, Robert, one of the things you're doing is you're, you're kind of starting something pretty new, right? right? Oh, oh, this is a brand new film festival. Nobody's done this before. How do you brand something that's never been branded before? Um, that is a great question. So the first thing I did doing, knowing what I know is I turned to my business partner, Derek Day of the Blake Project, and I said, we need to really think through this strategy. We need to really think through and like, I need to, I need to actually pay attention to what I tell our clients to uh, guide, guide them to think about uh, um, every day. You know, what would the world miss if we weren't here? Who would care? Why should they care? Um, what is the enemy, you know, uh, of, of our film festival? And the enemy is, is, combination of either apathy or just lack of knowledge people just aren't aware um but apathy is is sort of a, an enemy so um i think the good news is, is we got the strategy right to think through what our kind of promise was going to be um and a commitment to building a community um, of filmmakers and uh those in the water sector so it was really really critical that we start with you know what do we want to, what do we want to be reverse engineer that from an emotional perspective back to what our product of service was going to be, which was going to be uh, curation of films. Um, and how do we curate those with a strong emotional connection um, really to a very imperative thing and balance it, by the way, balance it with um, messages of hope, messages of laughter, along with those films that make you so angry um to see what is being done it is really important to, it was really important to us that people laughed at least once cried at least once and got really red faced angry at least once throughout the day <laughs> and i and i think that we did that the second thing um was from a visual branding perspective um how do we create an identity that represents world water film festival um and in the first iteration that we looked at it looked really cool you know, but then when you took that uh, that logo and you shrunk it to a business card, half of it was getting lost. It wouldn't it wouldn't reproduce as you shrunk it. So it's important in your visual identity to think about the the nature of your identity in multiple formations. So 
Our logo is a water drop with a camera that has the globe icon in it, kind of partially in there to inspire you to realize there's more to discover. Um, so brand strategy, visual branding. Um, and then I think the third step was, you know, since we were new, uh, credibility. You know, we're, we're, we're new to the water sector. We're people that knew branding. And, you know, I knew a little bit about film and creative for my acting chops. But it was important to start to forge relationships with the thought leaders uh, in the water sector. And um, it's kind of funny because when you when you get into uh, a mode where you are getting close to your event and you have so many things happening at the same time, it's easy to briefly forget who you've met along the way. And then remember, Oh my gosh, wait, I know this person. Wait a minute. Um, and uh, there's an organization out of the, the Dutch government in the Netherlands that manages a program called Water as Leverage. And Water as Leverage helps communities, the Dutch government helps communities that are either going to be water stressed or you know, coastal cities that'll be that are soon to be in, in big threat circumstance to help them view water as a solution and not just something to be scared of, but to bring it in. So um I just started, I really liked the people that worked at this organization. We forged a nice camaraderie. They had a couple films that they had produced about the different works they had done in Asia and in Cartagena. Um, and then it, I remembered that uh, they report to a man by the name of Hank Ovink. And Hank Ovink is the lead person behind the UN Water Conference that happened in New York this week in, in, in the Dutch government and, you know, He's the David Bowie of water of Europe. I mean, he's, you know, he's, <laughs> he's, he's a really big thought leader. Um, and he actually wanted to and came to give opening remarks at our film festival, which was, was huge. Um, and it was huge, not for me and for the film festival, while it was, but was huge is that Hank Obink, in his opening remarks, commented that um, his biggest fear you know, knowing how many things in water are are now broken and the way to fix it is actually the way back. That um, that all of us that have been involved in New York Water Week and that work in the water sector will come Monday morning, conference is over, we're catching up on emails, we kind of forget, you know, what we didn't get to or whatnot. Um, and then we realize that our emphasis was on a conference and not water. What are we going to do to keep this going? And he teared up and he's like, this is why I need efforts like the film festival to show the matters of the heart so that people can connect with the various water issues, crises and solutions. And, and to a sense to feel motivated to want to be a part of uh, a movement for a solution. Um, and one of the things that I believe that we've begun by bringing the creative sector together with the water sector, Gabriel, my hope. Um, <laughs> right now in marketing, there really isn't a um, a water advocate or a water champion. You know, if you want to market green products to people that are eco-conscious, is very loose, but there isn't a narrow specific focus to people that are concerned about water. Um, and ironically, <laughs> excuse me. <clears throat> so my hope is to, in doing this, by bringing the film community together with the creatives, that we're able to build a, a, a new army of water champions. The most ironic thing happened, Gabriel, is about six weeks ago, um, I live in an old apartment building in New York City. I would imagine people in the Pacific Northwest, if you live in a building that was built before 1980, you may have lead pipes still in your building um and the water in my apartment was suddenly coming out brown and gross and leaving this weird scummy residue yep. um and i asked the building owner to please test the water especially knowing what i've come to know <laughs> getting to know the people in the water sector um and they were very dismissive the building owner was like if you want to get the water tested you're on your own go for it but uh, we're not going to test the water. <clears throat> so I did. And uh, guess what I discovered? Um, while I was on a vacation, 
and I'll tell you why that, that comment is important, is that I have an unsafe level of copper and lead in my drinking water. And I found this information out, uh, Gabriel, while I was on vacation. And right now, the way the laws and regulations are, I think in our entire country, at least specifically in New York, I don't know about you, the states in the Pacific Northwest, but um, there are 39 apartments in my building. God forbid I had died in the plane crash on the way home. There is no current law, code of ethics, standards that would have obligated the water testing company that used this EPA 200.8 method, very accurate. They, don't even, they wouldn't even know how to, who do we notify? They don't even know who to notify. Is it the Environmental Protection Agency? Is it the Department of Environmental Protection? Is it the Department of Housing Development? You know, nobody knows who's who really kind of, hmm, the department, you know, so um, had I not made it home from my vacation, none of my other neighbors would know that we have a toxic level of lead and copper in our building. It's very scary. So um, I am discovering how complicated that is to figure that out as someone who has just lost a film festival at water. Even I'm having trouble figuring out how to resolve my water. I know what the solution is now, by the way. Um, and I have a pretty good idea what the problem is. Um, and in speaking with Dr. Lal, who is the head of the Columbia University Water Center, um, highly advise that you get your water tested once a year, wherever you live. Um, and uh, if you think that you are in, an, in, an, in a setting that could have any threat, you know, New York City has great water. The problem with the water is once you get inside an old building that has lead pipes with copper fittings and old water tanks that may get changed and they hammer the pipes to change the pipes that dislodges the calcification that's protecting you from lead, yada, yada. <clears throat> you get a tankless reverse osmosis drinking water system and change filters. And if any, if everybody, if anybody is hearing this, you know, is listening to this and even thinks remotely, my water might be of an issue, have a reverse osmosis, tankless drinking water system, um, you want to remineralize the water to make sure that you're getting the nutrients you need out of the water. Um, that's a simple step you can take. It is like a $300 investment off of uh, Amazon. You can get one of these systems put in. Um, you know, there's a big infrastructure push in our country right now to change all the lead pipes. Well, while we're waiting for that to happen, people are exposed to some pretty scary stuff. And, um, you know, I'm not... And, complete expert, but I have been told in my own experience, that's something I could do to protect myself so that I'm not having to buy bottled water, yeah. if you will. Yeah, I would. I must admit the first thing we did when we purchased our home was actually change the, the pipes to the kitchen. So those are all brand new. And then we recently remodeled the bathroom. So we changed all those pipes as well, slowly getting out all those old copper pipes. Uh, yeah, but yeah, it's, it's very true. You know, you, you mentioned three things that I think are super important for aspiring entrepreneurs to really understand. Because one, you're really trying to tackle a specific problem. So one, you've, you've identified a problem, you've identified a solution, you're trying to tackle it. But from a business perspective, you really broke it down into three areas. One, business strategy, right? Start with your business strategy. Two, brand guideline. Create a brand guideline and stick to that brand guideline. And then three, you have to be able to create the, the sense of that, you know, what you're doing, right? The, the competence piece, the confidence in the, the consumer. Why are those, th why were those three things? Why do you feel like from a business perspective, you've been doing this for some time, you know, what for a new inspiring entrepreneur, why are those three things so important? Um, it's a great question. You know, I think often people may discount marketing. Yep. Um, I agree. Mark, mark, marketing creates the future. It is the human side. It is the connective tissue uh, to your offering that helps your customers or employees or shareholders or stakeholders um, see that the world is better for them with your brand and product or service in it. Um, and, you know, your job as an entrepreneur or business owner is to inspire, to move people to understand and react that happens through marketing. If you don't do that strategy work from the get-go, then you're forced potentially with having to change people's perceptions, let alone trying to get them onto, onboarding them onto a perception <clears throat> in their mind in the first place. So it is really important that the strategy 
that you have for your product or service um, is as strong as your product or service. Once once your awareness is is achieved um, and people really understand that for which you stand, um, and that you know that 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 is as good as what you're bringing to their lives, um, you know you don't have to do any. You know, you, the course corrections you may make are going to be minor. It's going to be easier to navigate in and out of the the noise and traffic and, and distractions that will come your way uh, when you're launching something new. Yeah, yeah. Now, now, is this your first business? Have Have you created? Uh, you know, I know the Waterworks Film Festival is a nonprofit, but have you done other entrepreneurial endeavors outside of this one? Um, I will tell you that. Um, so it's an interesting question because um, I have worked in a few startup ventures. Um, I have created a new business within an established business. Um, when I left the National Basketball Association, Association. I went to go work for a minority owner of the Phoenix Suns, who was CEO of a holding company that owns 29 different sporting goods and technical apparel brands. And my job was to build a licensing program for from scratch for these brands. Um, and um, it's interesting. It, it was an interesting lesson. I mean, I kind of knew this from the NBA, but in the world of at least sporting goods, the sequence of importance is sort of product performance first, brand second. You know, here I'm talking about the importance of brand, but in the sporting goods specifically, the product performance has to perform the way you're saying it's going to perform or your brand doesn't mean anything, right? So to um, suddenly bring a brand first business unit, because you're in, in licensing, you are selling brands, you're not selling the product to get the 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 stakeholders of product performance to understand the importance of brand and brand strategy and all the nuances. Um, that was a little bit of a lift. We did it better in some places than others. Um, so I've done that <clears throat> and was successful in that environment um, in a very um, dicey, um, inconsistently protected portfolio of intellectual property. So, um, and with some kind of uh, mistakes, if you will, that um, I don't know that necessarily they were like disastrous mistakes, but they sure made the hill a lot harder to climb and navigate. Uh, for example, if you are entrepreneurial and you're doing a startup, and your sister's cousin's dog walker is a graphic artist and is willing to make a graphic for you. That's very nice. But you need to execute a document that assigns ownership of that art to you. If you don't execute a work for hire agreement and you actually don't own that artwork and your business takes off, that sister's friend's dog walkers could be like, hey, wait a minute, you're making a lot of money off of my art. You owe me money now. I own the trademark and they can prevent you from using, continuing to use that artwork. Um, that happened in one of the, there was an entrepreneurial brand in the portfolio called Ex Officio, wonderful company of travel apparel. Um, <clears throat> and they developed a great iconography for uh, their products. So, you know, for travel apparel, you know, insect repellent, safety features, SPF, whatever. The person that had developed those icons for them did it as a, as a favor when the company was young. And then as I was coming along to want to use those icons and licensing the brand into footwear uh, and travel bags and luggage, I didn't, I couldn't get permissions without compensating that artist for having created that artwork. And it just became an extra layer that would have been nice. You know, the other thing you can do is if you're starting to build something that's really starting to hum, um, talk to your attorney about uh, a watch service. A watch service is, you know, um, they'll alert you if someone is trying to register something complimentary in your in your trademark. So I'm not a lawyer. I'm not giving legal advice here. But one of the reasons Coca-Cola has licensed its brand into apparel and footwear and toys and trinkets and stuff is not because they want world dominance with their logo all over everything. It's to prevent others from using that name mm -hmm. in those product Sorry. classifications. It was a defensive mood. 
mode. So um, I was part of a team that launched uh, the Motown brand in the form of theme restaurants. Oh, um, so again, established brand uh, back in the day when theme restaurants were a thing. Yeah. Um, so uh, I have worked in established environments, but I have had a lot of entrepreneurial uh, efforts um, and, and joining the Blake project as a partner has been a wonderful thing because it is in being entrepreneurial and really being of, of, of valued service, trusted service to our clients. Um, we get to be, how do I say this? Um, I'm at a point in my career where we get to be a little selective in the types of projects that we take on. We've sort of accepted that uh, our DNA is, you know, doing good while doing good business. What we do has to have a, a greater purpose. Um, and so, um, you know, that compass uh, helps us, I think, really best serve <clears throat> some of the, the clients. And within sort of the established stuff that we do do, we actually launched uh a newer product of service recently which now that i think about it was pretty entrepreneurial um the world of expert witness work so um we saw an opportunity uh in the world of litigations um typically an accounting firm or valuation firm will be will be brought in to uh, assign or defend a value a value damages. You know, you infringed my trademark. It, you, the damage is worth this amount of money, and then someone's hired to say no, it's not, not worth that. We've been able to come in and serve as a a, a branding and uh, subject matter expert in licensing. Uh, so subject matter subject matter expert in licensing and branding. Uh, so when there is a, a litigation, we help put the numbers that are assigned to a damage into context for a judge and a jury. So you'll have a case where someone will say, you know, I'm a famous brand. They did this bad thing to me. And I actually had a case like this recently where I kind of had to diplomatically, because it's my style, it's coming and say, but are, are you really famous? Because you didn't really say why you're famous and really you're, <laughs> you're actually not famous. And here is why in the world of branding, and I was able to make a, a pretty articulate case that for a variety of reasons in this instance, the the, um, the uh, plaintiff in this case claimed they were a famous brand. They didn't consistently use their intellectual property. Their brand name was more of an idiomatic expression than it was a, a, a trademark. So the, the, the litmus test is, will the population be confused by what you claim? has been infringed or not. So um, that has actually been very rewarding work. Um, uh, I tend to, I, I think my time at the National Basketball Association, I, I don't know why I weirdly fell in love with contracts. I think they're <laughs> fascinating. Um, uh, and so, um, you know, to really uh, have, having that understanding and then to be of service to uh, clients, because sometimes, you know, sometimes litigation is, is legit and it's, it's really, there's a need for that. And, um, sometimes it's, hmm, you know, we, we don't take it. We won't take just any case and we have to really believe in the position, uh, of that, of that case. So, and what's interesting is in the, in the world of, of those types of things, real estate is a, um, regulated, valuation practice, non-real estate or intellectual property or artwork or whatever is not a regulated anything. So it's really incumbent upon uh, an attorney to bring in a subject matter expert to help contextualize why some number is, is, is really legit or not legit. Yeah, that makes sense. Like with paintings and things of that nature, sculpture is kind of difficult to put a price on it without a without an expertise. Now, one of the things you mentioned is, you know, in the, in the past you've worked with established folks, right? You, you you mentioned the Motown. How, but you know, working with established brands, but how do you work with a new brand, right? Especially like the Waterworks Film Festival, right? This is a brand new brand. Uh, brand you've been doing it for two years. What has been difficult about starting the brand? What has been easy? Um, so, uh, 
what has been difficult? That's a great question. So it's the World Water Film Festival. And um, I think I didn't know how much people don't know about water. You know, um, and it is interesting how in it's one thing when you hear a story about and you can kind of envision um you know somebody in the world that has to work for walk four hours a day just to get a jug of water to bring water back to the community like you can imagine like oh that sounds awful uh, but we have such a um oh there's a fix for that mentality especially in our country um I have uh, one of my clients and a friend of mine who both live in fairly wealthy suburbs. When I would talk about what I was doing with the World Water Film Festival um, and just the bizarre, strange water issues I'm discovering, there's some really weird. I mean, you hear about some in the news, but like my my favorite weird one, time out for a second. The state of Wisconsin is using so much road salt in the winter that they're at a precipice of permanently salinating their freshwater resources and aquifers. Like, can you imagine, like, you hear about, you hear about desalinization in Israel. You wouldn't imagine desalinization needing to be a thing in the state of Wisconsin. But road salt is in measurable quantities of that community's uh, Madison, Wisconsin drinking water. Anyway, these two friends of mine that live in these wealthy suburbs, as I'm talking about this, had, one had, a, oh yeah, there was a, there was a PFAS contamination and we had to put in a charcoal water filter. And I was like, and that's all you got to say about that? Like, wait, what? Do you have a PFAS <laughs> Can contamination? We <laughs> Can we elaborate on this? Like your only response is, oh, yes, I found a filter for that. You know, people think that, oh, ah, no. The other one was like, oh, yeah, there was a paint paint factory five miles down the road from us, and they contaminated our wells, so we had to put in a special reverse osmosis drinking water system. And again, <clears throat> so um, there needs to be a, it is fascinating that, there's little governance over kind of water aquifer, groundwater. You know, 99% of all the fresh water we need to live as a species is contained in groundwater. It's not in rivers, it's not in lakes, it's not in reservoirs. It's in the ground. And there's very little governance about what's happening three miles, eight miles, six miles down the road from you um, that can be affecting your groundwater supply, which is why it's really important to, to test your water once a year. So what's been hard also is that, um, and why I'm so grateful for to s s all of the filmmakers that submitted films is, you know, until you see the issue um, and can connect with it emotionally somehow, um, you know, a sense of apathy or, oh, I can buy a filter at Home Depot for that. No, we shouldn't have to buy Home Depot. We shouldn't have to buy filters for everything. Yeah, We should just have, a, it should be a basic human right you know, the UN has these strategic development goals. Number six is about access to clean water for all. Um, <clears throat> so it did surprise me how um, people don't connect the emotional uh, side of things. Um, that has been, that has been hard. Um, what has been easy, I think was the second part of the question or what has been not so hard. What, yeah, not so hard. We'll um, say. <laughs> Well, that's so hard. Um, you know, once once there is a sense of awareness, um, uh, there a light bulb goes off. You know, like oh wow, no, I can wrap my head around this. Um, it is really adorable. I have friends now. Um, one friend who works in the television media business. That since I've tuned him into some watching some of these films and he's been to two of our events now um i think every two weeks he's texting me did you see this water story in the news <laughs> like and he's all worked up about it but that is exactly what we need to have happen in this yeah. world you know people need to be like fired up about wait a minute what is what is what is what is happening um with governance and policy and you know, uh, I was speaking with Dr. Lal, again, head of the Columbia University Water Center, uh, about my own water issue. You know, um, how hard it is to navigate, but that there are people that are willing to help you. The water sector has been very welcoming. 
the lead, the thought, the, the thought leaders of, of, of the Netherlands, you know, which is kind of all about water since their whole country is kind of under <laughs> sea level. Um, they've all been very collaborative and, and supportive and fascinating and um, wonderful to, to work with. Um, to do a little bit answer what's been hard and what do I see is, is, is going to be easy. Dr. Law was sharing an experience that he was in uh, on a panel once upon a time. And uh, the discussion came up about uh, low income housing and uh, where there have been water issues in low income housing, public housing systems in our country. Um, and this policymaker, policy, one of the things that has been hard to understand is why the science and policy is so siloed, right? But what's been wonderful is how quickly the the, the, the film and creative people are like, oh yeah, I've got stories for that. Let's yeah, let's let's yeah. let's they, let's amplify those crises and solutions. Um, but this this policymaker was so um, ill ill educated, misinformed, um, and had this weird idea in their head that low income people living in a low income housing wouldn't be smart enough to know how to change a water filter that we should just plan on giving people that have water contamination issues in low-income housing bottled water. And I I was looking at Dr. Lal's face on the Zoom, um, and we had the same look, like, are you, are, you, are you kidding me? Like, if you can change a light bulb, you could change a water filter. Like, why would anybody think this? Why would anybody think that people aren't capable? Um so what has been really surprising and wonderful is to see so many organizations doing such amazing work um, at all levels. One of the things that has been surprising to me, there's a website called joshswaterjobs.com, so J-O-S-H-S, waterjobs.com. On any given day, and this is only a partial listing, um, from entry level to PhD, there are no less than like 1,100 open water jobs around the world right now. One of the things that that seem that, that is hard to understand um, is that there are not enough young people going to work in the water sector. In our country, in the United States, we have a fair number of water treatment and water sewage treatment plants that whose operators are about to retire, and there are nowhere near enough people trained to step in and operate these water treatment systems. So. Um, what has been really beautiful is seeing the efforts that these governmental, non-governmental organizations, but trade associations, there's a trade association for everything. But in this instance, there's one called the Water Environment Federation, WEF. Um, I just got a little chill even just saying this. Uh, such a wonderful, thoughtful, important trade association. Um, absolutely committed to storytelling and attracting young people into the water sector. And so as we look to efforts going forward, one of the things that we want to begin to highlight um, is uh, careers in water through film. You know, one of the things we're hoping to curate eventually is if we have a film and we have a film showing to populate somewhere, it took a, you know, we at our film festival, we just had Gabriel, we had the Dutch water as leverage people um showcase two films and we had a photo exhibit and we have those photo exhibits on our gallery on our website uh worldwaterff.org and in speaking with them you know uh and one of the reasons it's so exciting to be creating the world water film festival in concert with these other efforts is they see a photograph of a water issue and a solution you know let's just imagine a woman standing at a well beautifully photographed what I have come to see in a picture of a woman at a well is it took a policymaker to make some decision about that well. It took an engineer and a hydrologist to figure out where am I going to dig that well. It took a contractor who had to know how to dig that well. It took a plumber to hook that well up. I mean, there are so many jobs. Yeah, it took point. a communications director. It took so many jobs to enable that photograph of that person standing at a well to even exist in the first place. We need people to be focused on water. We need water champions. And if you're thinking, if you're listening to this and you're thinking of a career change or you're thinking, gee, I don't know if I, what I'm doing feels purpose-driven enough, you don't have to be a scientist to go work in the water sector. 
I started a film festival. I'm a foreign language major from an engineering school. I started a film, but I'm now working in the water sector. Um, anybody can work in the water sector. And that's one of the things I love about Josh's water jobs is there are entry level jobs to, um, you know, advanced level jobs. So the fact that there are organizations and institutions and trade associations willing to provide resources, WEP probably provides training. You've got places like the Groundwater Project. If you Google that, they, they, they'll mail you a free book. You know, there are resources you can download. There are people that want to impart information and knowledge to help you identify as a water champion and maybe uh, move the needle a little bit in your own communities. Nice. I love it. You know, it, it's there's so many different ways to kind of get involved. And you provide, I think, the listeners so much information and advice, not only regarding branding, but also in regards to like clean water, water use uh, and how to really test your water and make sure you're kind of thinking of those things. Now, for the listeners, what about if they're interested in connecting with you? What if they're interested in learning more about Waterworld? What's the social media sites, the websites? How can they get in contact with you? So um, it is worldwaterff.org. FF as in uh, film festival, so worldwaterff.org. Um, at worldwaterff on social media platforms. Um, you can tag us on LinkedIn. We are on Instagram and Facebook. Um, and if you are interested in uh, the branding side of things, uh, we have uh, one of the things that the Blake Project does, which I, I, I wanted to make mention of, um, because it, it's it's consistent, I think, with the DNA that I was sharing with you earlier. We've created a, um, a free service called the Branding Strategy Insider.com. It is uh, it's through thought leadership um, articles. Anything on branding, you can find. Uh, we have over 60,000 subscribers. It was founded in 2006. Um, it is a wonderful resource. You can find um, us on brandingstrategyinsider.com. Um, if you're interested in branding matters or understanding your how branding is important in your in your own entrepreneurial endeavors, um, theblakeproject.com is the business side of things. Um, but anybody is welcome to reach out to me. My information is on both the Blake project.com and worldwaterff.com without a work, excuse me, um, worldwaterff.org uh, under our, you know, meet our team. Excellent. Excellent. And, and as always, this is a good reminder to plug the shades of entrepreneurship newsletter, because this information will be on the shades of entrepreneurship newsletter the week before the episode airs the week, the episode airs and the week after you can do that by visiting the shades of e.com. You can also follow me on LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram, TikTok at the shades of e robert thank you so much uh for your time i really do appreciate it in fact for those folks that are listening we were kind of going a little crazy when we first started this because i had a severed cord i had to figure out some things and so robert thank you so much for your patience i really do appreciate it behind the scenes it probably looks like nothing but we were certainly like ducks in the background uh calm on top crazy on the bottom uh so robert is there any last things you want to say to the folks that are listening um, and just Gabriel, thank you for having me on uh, today. I really do appreciate it. Um, and I would say to anybody thinking about starting something new, I didn't know how I was going to start this film festival. I just started doing it. I just started reaching out to people and people responded. And sometimes you're going to get a no in an answer, but that's okay. That just means you need to go in a different direction, but you got to keep going. And if you do, um, your vision can be real. Robert, the last strand. Thank you so much again for this opportunity. I really do appreciate it. And again, for those listening, please follow me at the shades of E on the social sites and subscribe to the newsletter at the shades of E.com. Thank you and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to the shades of entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit the shades of E.com. 